Chapter Seventeen of the Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume Two, by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. The Domain of Arnhem. The garden, like a lady fair, was cut that lay as if she slumbered in delight and to the open skies her eyes did shut the azure fields of heaven were assembled right in a large round set with the flowers of light the flowers de luce and the round sparks of dew that hung upon their azure leaves did shew like twinkling stars that sparkle in the evening blue giles fletcher from his cradle to his grave a gale of prosperity bore my friend ellison along nor do i use the word prosperity in its mere worldly sense i mean it as synonymous with happiness the person of whom i speak seemed born for the purpose of foreshadowing the doctrines of turgo price priestly and condurque of exemplifying by individual instance what has been deemed the chimera of the perfectionists in the brief existence of ellison i fancy that i have seen refuted the dogma that in man's very nature lies some hidden principle the antagonist of bliss an anxious examination of his career has given me to understand that in general from the violation of a few simple laws of humanity arises the wretchedness of mankind that as a species we have in our possession the as yet unwrought elements of content and that even now in the present darkness and madness of all thought on the great question of the social condition it is not impossible that man the individual under certain unusual and highly fortuitous conditions may be happy with opinions such as these my young friend too was fully imbued and thus it is worthy of observation that the uninterrupted enjoyment which distinguished his life was in great measure the result of preconcert it is indeed evident that with less of the instinctive philosophy which now and then stands so well in the stead of experience mr ellison would have found himself precipitated by the very extraordinary success of his life into the common vortex of unhappiness which yawns for those of pre-eminent endowments but it is by no means my object to pen an essay on happiness the ideas of my friend may be summed up in a few words he admitted but four elementary principles or more strictly conditions of bliss that which he considered chief was strange to say the simple and purely physical one of free exercise in the open air the health he said attainable by other means is scarcely worth the name he instanced the ecstasies of the fox-hunter, and pointed to the tillers of the earth, the only people who, as a class, can be fairly considered happier than others. The only people who, as a class, can be fairly considered happier than others. His second condition was the love of woman his third 
and most difficult of realization was the contempt of ambition his fourth was an object of unceasing pursuit and he held that other things being equal the extent of attainable happiness was in proportion to the spirituality of this object ellison was remarkable in the continuous profusion of good gifts lavished upon him by fortune ellison was remarkable in the continuous profusion of good gifts lavished upon him by fortune in personal grace and beauty he exceeded all men his intellect was of that order to which the acquisition of knowledge is less a labour than an intuition and a necessity his family was one of the most illustrious of the empire his bride was the loveliest and most devoted of women his possessions had been always ample but on the attainment of his majority it was discovered that one of those extraordinary freaks of fate had been played in his behalf which startle the whole social world amid which they occur and seldom fail radically to alter the moral constitution of those who are their objects it appears that about a hundred years before mr ellison's coming of age there had died in a remote province one mr seabright ellison this gentleman had amassed a princely fortune and having no immediate connections conceived the whim of suffering his wealth to accumulate for a century after his decease minutely and sagaciously directing the various modes of investment he bequeathed the aggregate amount to the nearest of blood bearing the name of ellison who should be alive at the end of the hundred years many attempts had been made to set aside this singular bequest their ex post facto character rendered them abortive but the attention of a jealous government was aroused and a legislative act finally obtained forbidding all similar accumulations this act however did not prevent young ellison from entering into possession on his twenty-first birthday as the heir of his ancestor seabright of a fortune of four hundred and fifty millions of dollars an incident similar in outline to the one here imagined occurred not very long ago in england the name of the fortunate heir was thelusson i first saw an account of this matter in the tour of prince pukla moscow who makes the sum inherited ninety millions of pounds and justly observes that in the contemplation of so vast a sum and of the services to which it might be applied there is something even of the sublime to suit the views of this article i have followed the prince's statement although a grossly exaggerated one the germ and in fact the commencement of the present paper was published many years ago previous to the issue of the first number of sous admirable juif errant which may possibly have been suggested to him by moscow's account when it had become known that such was the enormous wealth inherited there were of course many speculations as to the mode of its disposal the magnitude 
and the immediate availability of the sum bewildered all who thought on the topic the possessor of any appreciable amount of money might have been imagined to perform any one of a thousand things with riches merely surpassing those of any citizen it would have been easy to suppose him engaging in supreme excess in the fashionable extravagances of his time or busying himself with political intrigue or aiming at ministerial power or purchasing increase of nobility or collecting large museums of vertu or playing the munificent patron of letters of science of art or endowing and bestowing his name upon extensive institutions of charity but for the inconceivable wealth in the actual possession of the heir these objects and all ordinary objects were felt to afford too limited a field recourse was had to figures and these but sufficed to confound it was seen that even at three per cent the annual income of the inheritance amounted to no less than thirteen millions and five hundred thousand dollars which was one million and one hundred and twenty five thousand per month or thirty six thousand nine hundred and eighty six per day or one thousand five hundred and forty one per hour or six and twenty dollars for every minute that flew thus the usual track of supposition was thoroughly broken up men knew not what to imagine there were some who even conceived that mr ellison would divest himself of at least one half of his fortune as of utterly superfluous opulence enriching whole troops of his relatives by division of his superabundance to the nearest of these he did in fact abandon the very unusual wealth which was his own before the inheritance i was not surprised however to perceive that he had long made up his mind on a point which had occasioned so much discussion to his friends nor was i greatly astonished at the nature of his decision in regard to individual charities he had satisfied his conscience in the possibility of any improvement properly so called being effected by man himself in the general condition of man he had i am sorry to confess it little faith upon the whole whether happily or unhappily he was thrown back in very great measure upon self in the widest and noblest sense he was a poet he comprehended moreover the true character the august aims the supreme majesty and dignity of the poetic sentiment the fullest if not the sole proper satisfaction of this sentiment he instinctively felt to lie in the creation of novel forms of beauty some peculiarities either in his early education or in the nature of his intellect had tinged with what is termed materialism all his ethical speculations and it was this bias perhaps which led him to believe that the most advantageous at least if not the sole legitimate field for the poetic experience lies in the creation of novel moods of purely physical loveliness thus it happened he became neither musician nor poet if we use this latter term in its everyday acceptation or it might have been that he neglected to become either merely in pursuance of his idea that in contempt of ambition is to be found 
one of the essential principles of happiness on earth. It is not indeed possible that, while a high order of genius is necessarily ambitious, the highest is above that which is termed ambition, and may it not thus happen that many far greater than Milton have contentedly remained mute and inglorious. I believe that the world has never seen, and that, unless through some series of accidents, goading the noblest order of mind into distasteful exertion, the world will never see, that full extent of triumphant execution in the richer domains of art, of which the human nature is absolutely capable. Ellison became neither musician nor poet, although no man lived more profoundly enamoured of music and poetry. Under other circumstances than those which invested him, it is not impossible that he would have become a painter. Sculpture, although in its nature rigorously poetical, was too limited in its extent and consequences to have occupied at any time much of his attention. And I have now mentioned all the provinces in which the common understanding of the poetic sentiment has declared it capable of expatiating. But Ellison maintained that the richest, the truest, and most natural, if not altogether the most extensive province, had been unaccountably neglected. No definition had spoken of the landscape gardener as of the poet, yet it seemed to my friend that the creation of the landscape garden offered to the proper muse the most magnificent of opportunities. Here, indeed, was the fairest field for the display of imagination in the endless combining of forms of novel beauty, the elements to enter into combination being, by a vast superiority, the most glorious which the earth could afford. In the multiform and multicolour of the flowers and the trees, he recognised the most direct and energetic efforts of nature at physical loveliness, and in the direction or concentration of this effort, or, more properly, in its adaptation to the eyes which were to behold it on earth, he perceived that he should be employing the best means, labouring to the greatest advantage, in the fulfilment not only of his own destiny as poet, but of the august purposes for which the deity had implanted the poetic sentiment in man. Its adaptation to the eyes which were to behold it on earth. In his explanation of this phraseology, Mr. Ellison did much toward solving what has always seemed to me an enigma. I mean the fact, which none but the ignorant dispute, that no such combination of scenery exists in nature as the painter of genius may produce. No such paradises are to be found in reality as have glowed on the canvas of Claude. In the most enchanting of natural landscapes, there will always be found a defect or an excess, many excesses and defects. While the component parts may defy, individually, the highest skill of the artist, the arrangement of these parts will always be susceptible of improvement. In short, no position can be attained on the wide surface of the natural earth, from which an artistical eye, looking steadily, will not find matter of offence in what is termed the composition of the landscape. 
and yet how unintelligible is this in all other matters we are justly instructed to regard nature as supreme with her details we shrink from competition who shall presume to imitate the colours of the tulip or to improve the proportions of the lily of the valley the criticism which says of sculpture or portraiture that here nature is to be exalted or idealized rather than imitated is in error no pictorial or sculptural combinations of points of human loveliness do more than approach the living and breathing beauty in landscape alone is the principle of the critic true and having felt its truth here it is but the headlong spirit of generalization which has led him to pronounce it true throughout all the domains of art having i say felt its truth here for the feeling is no affectation or chimera the mathematics afford no more absolute demonstrations than the sentiments of his art yields the artist he not only believes but positively knows that such and such apparently arbitrary arrangements of matter constitute and alone constitute the true beauty his reasons however have not yet been matured into expression it remains for a more profound analysis than the world has yet seen fully to investigate and express them nevertheless he is confirmed in his instinctive opinions by the voice of all his brethren let a composition be defective let an emendation be wrought in its mere arrangement of form let this emendation be submitted to every artist in the world by each will its necessity be admitted and even far more than this in a remedy of the defective composition each insulated member of the fraternity would have suggested the identical emendation i repeat that in landscape arrangements alone is the physical nature susceptible of exaltation and that therefore her susceptibility of improvement at this one point was a mystery i had been unable to solve my own thoughts on the subject had rested in the idea that the primitive intention of nature would have so arranged the earth's surface as to have fulfilled at all points man's sense of perfection in the beautiful the sublime or the picturesque but that this primitive intention had been frustrated by the known geological disturbances disturbances of form and colour grouping in the correction or allaying of which lies the soul of art the force of this idea was much weakened however by the necessity which it involved of considering the disturbances abnormal and unadapted to any purpose it was ellison who suggested that they were prognostic of death he thus explained admit the earthly immortality of man to have been the first intention we have then the primitive arrangement of the earth's surface adapted to his blissful estate as not existent but designed the disturbances were the preparations for his subsequently conceived deathful condition now said my friend what we regard as exaltation of the landscape may be really such as respects only the moral or human point of view each alteration of the natural scenery may possibly effect a blemish in the picture if we can suppose this picture viewed at large in mass from 
some point distant from the earth's surface although not beyond the limits of its atmosphere it is easily understood that what might improve a closely scrutinized detail may at the same time injure a general or more distantly observed effect there may be a class of beings human once but now invisible to humanity to whom from afar our disorder may seem order our unpicturesqueness picturesque in a word the earth angels for whose scrutiny more especially than our own and for whose death refined appreciation of the beautiful may have been set in array by god the wide landscape gardens of the hemispheres in the course of discussion my friend quoted some passages from a writer on landscape gardening who has been supposed to have well treated his theme there are properly but two styles of landscape gardening the natural and the artificial one seeks to recall the original beauty of the country by adapting its means to the surrounding scenery cultivating trees in harmony with the hills or plain of the neighbouring land detecting and bringing into practice those nice relations of size proportion and colour which hid from the common observer are revealed everywhere to the experienced student of nature the result of the natural style of gardening is seen rather in the absence of all defects and incongruities in the prevalence of a healthy harmony and order than in the creation of any special wonders or miracles the artificial style has as many varieties as there are different tastes to gratify it has a certain general relation to the various styles of building there are the stately avenues and retirements of versailles italian terraces and a various mixed old english style which bears some relation to the domestic gothic or english elizabethan architecture whatever may be said against the abuses of the artificial landscape gardening a mixture of pure art in a garden scene adds to it a great beauty this is partly pleasing to the eye by the show of order and design and partly moral a terrace with an old moss-covered balustrade calls up at once to the eye the fair forms that have passed there in other days the slightest exhibition of art is an evidence of care and human interest from what i have already observed said ellison you will understand that i reject the idea here expressed of recalling the original beauty of the country the original beauty is never so great as that which may be introduced of course everything depends on the selection of a spot with capabilities what is said about detecting and bringing into practice nice relations of size proportion and colour is one of those mere vaguenesses of speech which serve to veil inaccuracy of thought the phrase quoted may mean anything or nothing and guides in no degree that the true result of the natural style of gardening is seen rather in the absence of all defects and incongruities than in the creation of any special wonders or miracles is a proposition better suited to the grovelling apprehension of the herd than to the fervid dreams of the man of genius the negative merit suggested appertains to that hobbling criticism which in letters would elevate addison into apotheosis in truth while that virtue which consists 
in the mere avoidance of vice, appeals directly to the understanding, and can thus be circumscribed in rule the loftier virtue, which flames in creation, can be apprehended in its results alone. Rule applies but to the merits of denial, to the excellences which refrain. Beyond these, the critical art can but suggest. We may be instructed to build a Cato, but we are in vain told how to conceive a Parthenon or an Inferno. The thing done, however, the wonder accomplished, and the capacity for apprehension becomes universal. The sophists of the negative school, who, through inability to create, have scoffed at creation, are now found the loudest in applause. What, in its chrysalis condition of principle, affronted their demure reason, never fails, in its maturity of accomplishment, to extort admiration from their instinct of beauty. The author's observations on the artificial style, continued Ellison, are less objectionable. A mixture of pure art in a garden scene adds to it a great beauty. This is just, as also is the reference to the sense of human interest. The principle expressed is incontrovertible, but there may be something beyond it. There may be an object in keeping with the principle, an object unobtainable by the means ordinarily possessed by individuals, yet which, if attained, would lend a charm to the landscape garden, far surpassing that which a sense of merely human interest could bestow. A poet, having very unusual pecuniary resources, might, while retaining the necessary idea of art or culture, or, as our author expresses it, of interest, so imbue his designs at once with extent and novelty of beauty, as to convey the sentiment of spiritual interference. It will be seen that, in bringing about such result, he secures all the advantages of interest or design, while relieving his work of the harshness or technicality of the worldly art. In the most rugged of wildernesses, in the most savage of the scenes of pure nature, there is apparent the art of a creator, yet this art is apparent to reflection only. In no respect, as if the obvious force of a feeling. Now, let us suppose this sense of the almighty design to be one step depressed, to be brought into something like harmony or consistency with the sense of human art, to form an intermedium between the two. Let us imagine, for example, a landscape whose combined vastness and definitiveness, whose united beauty, magnificence, and strangeness, shall convey the idea of care, or culture, or superintendence, on the part of beings superior yet akin to humanity, then the sentiment of interest is preserved, while the art intervolved is made to assume the air of an intermediate or secondary nature, a nature which is not God, nor an emanation from God, but which still is nature, in the sense of the handiwork of the angels that hover between man and God. It was in devoting his enormous wealth to the embodiment of a vision such as this, in the free exercise in the open air, ensured by the personal superintendence of his plans, in the unceasing object which these plans afforded, in the high spirituality of the object, in the contempt of ambition which it enabled him truly to feel, in the perennial springs with which it gratified, without possibility of satiating, that one master passion of his soul, the thirst for beauty. Above all, it was in the sympathy of a woman not unwomanly, whose loveliness and love enveloped his existence in the purple atmosphere of paradise, 
that Ellison thought to find, and found, exemption from the ordinary cares of humanity, with a far greater amount of positive happiness than ever glowed in the rapt daydreams of de Stael. I despair of conveying to the reader any distinct conception of the marvels which my friend did actually accomplish. I wish to describe, but am disheartened by the difficulty of description, and hesitate between detail and generality. Perhaps the better course will be to unite the two in their extremes. Mr. Ellison's first step regarded, of course, the choice of a locality, and scarcely had he commenced thinking on this point when the luxuriant nature of the Pacific Islands arrested his attention. In fact, he had made up his mind for a voyage to the South Seas, when a night's reflection induced him to abandon the idea. "'Were I misanthropic,' he said, "'such a locale would suit me. The thoroughness of its insulation and seclusion, and the difficulty of ingress and egress, would, in such case, be the charm of charms, but as yet I am not time on. I wish the composure, but not the depression of solitude. There must remain with me a certain control over the extent and duration of my repose. There will be frequent hours in which I shall need, too, the sympathy of the poetic in what I have done. Let me seek, then, a spot not far from a popular city, whose vicinity also will best enable me to execute my plans. In search of a suitable place so situated, Ellison travelled for several years, and I was permitted to accompany him. A thousand spots with which I was enraptured, he rejected without hesitation, for reasons which satisfied me in the end that he was right. We came at length to an elevated tableland of wonderful fertility and beauty, affording a panoramic prospect very little less in extent than that of Etna, and, in Ellison's opinion, as well as my own, surpassing the far-famed view from that mountain in all the true elements of the picturesque. "'I am aware,' said the traveller, as he drew a sigh of deep delight, after gazing on this scene entranced for nearly an hour. I know that here, in my circumstances, nine-tenths of the most fastidious of men would rest content. This panorama is indeed glorious, and I should rejoice in it, but for the excess of its glory. The taste of all the architects I have ever known leads them, for the sake of prospect, to put up buildings on hilltops. The error is obvious. Grandeur in any of its moods, but especially in that of extent, startles, excites, and then fatigues, depresses. For the occasional scene, nothing can be better. For the constant view, nothing worse. And in the constant view, the most objectionable phase of grandeur is that of extent the worst phase of extent, that of distance. It is at war with the sentiment and with the sense of seclusion, the sentiment and sense which we seek to humour in retiring to the country. In looking from the summit of a mountain, we cannot help feeling abroad in the world. The heart-sick avoid distant prospects as a pestilence. It was not until toward the close of the fourth year of our search that we found a locality with which Ellison professed himself satisfied. It is, of course, needless to say, where was the locality? The late death of my friend, in causing his domain to be thrown open to certain classes of visitors, has given to Arnheim a species of secret and subdued, if not solemn, celebrity similar in kind, although infinitely superior in degree, to that which so long distinguished Fonto. 
the usual approach to arnheim was by the river the visitor left the city in the early morning during the forenoon he passed between shores of a tranquil and domestic beauty on which grazed innumerable sheep their white fleeces spotting the vivid green of rolling meadows by degrees the idea of cultivation subsided into that of merely pastoral care this slowly became merged in a sense of retirement this again in a consciousness of solitude as the evening approached the channel grew more narrow the banks more and more precipitous and these latter were clothed in rich more profuse and more sombre foliage the water increased in transparency the stream took a thousand turns so that at no moment could its gleaming surface be seen for a greater distance than a furlong at every instant the vessel seemed imprisoned within an enchanted circle having insuperable and impenetrable walls of foliage a roof of ultramarine satin and no floor the keel balancing itself with admirable nicety on that of a phantom bark which by some accident having been turned upside down floated in constant company with the substantial one for the purpose of sustaining it the channel now became a gorge although the term is somewhat inapplicable and i employ it merely because the language has no word which better represents the most striking not the most distinctive feature of the scene the character of gorge was maintained only in the height and parallelism of the shores it was lost altogether in their other traits the walls of the ravine through which the clear water still tranquilly flowed arose to an elevation of a hundred and occasionally of a hundred and fifty feet and inclined so much toward each other as in a great measure to shut out the light of day while the long plume-like moss which depended densely from the intertwining shrubberies overhead gave the whole chasm an air of funereal gloom the windings became more frequent and intricate and seemed often as if returning in upon themselves so that the voyager had long lost all idea of direction he was moreover enwrapped in an exquisite sense of the strange the thought of nature still remained but her character seemed to have undergone modification there was a weird symmetry a thrilling uniformity a wizard propriety in these her works not a dead branch not a withered leaf not a stray pebble not a patch of the brown earth was anywhere visible the crystal water welled up against the clean granite or the unblemished moss with a sharpness of outline that delighted while it bewildered the eye having threaded the mazes of this channel for some hours the gloom deepening every moment a sharp and unexpected turn of the vessel brought it suddenly as if dropped from heaven into a circular basin of very considerable extent when compared with the width of the gorge it was about two hundred yards in diameter and girt in at all points but one that immediately fronting the vessel as it entered by hills equal in general height to the walls of the chasm although of a thoroughly different character their sides sloped from the water's edge at an angle of some forty-five degrees and they were clothed from base to summit not a perceptible point escaping in a drapery of the most gorgeous flower blossoms scarcely a green leaf being visible among the sea of odorous and fluctuating colour this basin was of great depth but so transparent was the water 
that the bottom, which seemed to consist of a thick mass of small round alabaster pebbles, was distinctly visible by glimpses, that is to say, whenever the eye could permit itself not to see, far down in the inverted heaven, the duplicate blooming of the hills. On these latter there were no trees, nor even shrubs of any size. The impressions wrought on the observer were those of richness, warmth, colour, quietude, uniformity, softness, delicacy, daintiness, voluptuousness, and a miraculous extremeness of culture that suggested dreams of a new race of fairies, laborious, tasteful, magnificent, and fastidious. But as the eye traced upward the myriad-tinted slope from its sharp junction with the water to its vague termination amid the folds of overhanging cloud, it became, indeed, difficult not to fancy a panoramic cataract of rubies, sapphires, opals, and golden onyxes rolling silently out of the sky. The visitor, shooting suddenly into this bay from at the gloom of the ravine, is delighted but astounded by the full orb of the declining sun, which he had supposed to be already far below the horizon, but which now confronts him and forms the sole termination of an otherwise limitless vista seen through another chasm-like rift in the hills. But here the voyager quits the vessel which has borne him so far, and descends into a light canoe of ivory, stained with arabesque devices in vivid scarlet, both within and without. The poop and beak of this boat arise high above the water with sharp points, so that the general form is that of an irregular crescent. It lies on the surface of the bay, with the proud grace of a swan. On its ermine floor reposes a single feathery paddle of satin wood, but no oarsman or attendant is to be seen. The guest is bidden to be of good cheer, that the fates will take care of him. The larger vessel disappears, and he is left alone in the canoe, which lies apparently motionless in the middle of the lake. While he considers what course to pursue, however, he becomes aware of a gentle movement in the fairy bark. It slowly swings itself around until its prow points toward the sun. It advances with a gentle but gradually accelerated velocity, while the slight ripples it creates seem to break about the ivory side in divinest melody, seem to offer the only possible explanation of the soothing yet melancholy music for whose unseen origin the bewildered voyager looks around him in vain. The canoe steadily proceeds, and the rocky gate of the vista is approached, so that its depths can be more distinctly seen. To the right arise a chain of lofty hills, rudely and luxuriantly wooded. It is observed, however, that the trait of exquisite cleanness where the bank dips into the water still prevails. There is not one token of the usual river debris. To the left, the character of the scene is softer and more obviously artificial. Here, the bank slopes upward from the stream in a very gentle ascent, forming a broad sward of grass of a texture resembling nothing so much as velvet, and of a brilliancy of green which would bear comparison with the tint of the purest emerald. This plateau varies in width from ten to three hundred yards, reaching from the river bank to a wall fifty feet high, which extends in an infinity of curves, but following the general direction of the river until lost in the distance to the westward. This wall is of one continuous rock, and has been formed by cutting perpendicularly the once rugged precipice of the stream's southern bank, but no trace of the labour has been suffered to remain. The chiselled stone has the hue of ages, and is profusely overhung and overspread with the ivy, the coral honeysuckle, the eglantine, 
and the clematis. The uniformity of the top and bottom lines of the wall is fully relieved by occasional trees of gigantic height, growing singly or in small groups, both along the plateau and in the domain behind the wall, but in close proximity to it, so that frequent limbs, of the black walnut especially, reach over and dip their pendant extremities into the water. Farther back within the domain, the vision is impeded by an impenetrable screen of foliage. These things are observed during the canoe's gradual approach to what I have called the gate of the vista. On drawing nearer to this, however, its chasm-like appearance vanishes. A new outlet from the bay is discovered to the left, in which direction the wall is also seen to sweep, still following the general course of the stream. Down this new opening the eye cannot penetrate very far, for the stream, accompanied by the wall, still bends to the left, until both are swallowed up by the leaves. The boat, nevertheless, glides magically into the winding channel, and here the shore opposite the wall is found to resemble that opposite the wall in the straight vista. Lofty hills rising occasionally into mountains, and covered with vegetation in wild luxuriance, still shut in the scene. Floating gently onward, but with a velocity slightly augmented, the voyager, after many short turns, finds his progress apparently barred by a gigantic gate or rather door of burnished gold, elaborately carved and fretted, and reflecting the direct rays of the now fast sinking sun with an effulgence that seems to wreath the whole surrounding forest in flames. This gate is inserted in the lofty wall, which here appears to cross the river at right angles. In a few moments, however, it is seen that the main body of the water still sweeps in a gentle and extensive curve to the left, the wall following it as before, while a stream of considerable volume, diverging from the principal one, makes its way with a slight ripple under the door, and is thus hidden from sight. The canoe falls into the lesser channel and approaches the gate. Its ponderous wings are slowly and musically expanded. The boat glides between them, and commences a rapid descent into a vast amphitheatre entirely begirt with purple mountains, whose bases are laved by a gleaming river throughout the full extent of their circuit. Meantime, the whole paradise of Arnheim bursts upon the view. There is a gush of enchancing melody, there is an oppressive sense of strange sweet odour. There is a dreamlike intermingling to the eye of tall slender eastern trees, bosky shrubberies, flocks of golden and crimson birds, leddy fringed lakes, meadows of violets, tulips, poppies, hyacinths and tuberoses, long intertangled lines of silver streamlets, and upspringing confusedly from amid all, a mass of semi-Gothic, semi-Saracenic architecture sustaining itself by miracle in mid-air, glittering in the red sunlight with a hundred aureoles, minarets, and pinnacles, and seeming the phantom handiwork, conjointly, of the sylphs, of the fairies, of the genii, and of the gnomes. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 2, by Edgar Allan Poe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tony Addison. Landor's Cottage, a pendant to the domain of Arnhem. During a pedestrian trip last summer, 
through one or two of the river counties of New York, I found myself, as the day declined, somewhat embarrassed about the road I was pursuing. The land undulated very remarkably, and my path for the last hour had wound about and about so confusedly in its effort to keep in the valleys that I no longer knew in what direction lay the sweet village of B, where I had determined to stop for the night. The sun had scarcely shone, strictly speaking, during the day, which, nevertheless, had been unpleasantly warm. A smoky mist, resembling that of the Indian summer, enveloped all things, and, of course, added to my uncertainty. Not that I cared much about the matter. If I did not hit upon the village before sunset, or even before dark, it was more than possible that a little Dutch farmhouse, or something of that kind, would soon make its appearance, although, in fact, the neighbourhood, perhaps on account of being more picturesque than fertile, was very sparsely inhabited. At all events, with my knapsack for a pillow, and my hound as a sentry, a bivouac in the open air was just the thing which would have amused me. I sauntered on, therefore, quite at ease, Ponto taking charge of my gum, until at length, just as I had begun to consider whether the numerous little glades that led hither and thither were intended to be paths at all, I was conducted by one of them into an unquestionable carriage track. There could be no mistaking it. The traces of light wheels were evident, and although the tall shrubberies and overgrown undergrowth met overhead, there was no obstruction whatever below, even to the passage of a Virginian mountain wagon, the most aspiring vehicle, I take it, of its kind. The road, however, except in being open through the wood, if wood be not too weighty a name for such an assemblage of light trees, and except in the particulars of evident wheel-tracks, bore no resemblance to any road I had before seen. The tracks of which I speak were but faintly perceptible, having been impressed upon the firm yet pleasantly moist surface of what looked more like green Genoese velvet than anything else. It was grass, clearly, but grass such as we seldom see out of England, so short, so thick, so even, and so vivid in colour. Not a single impediment lay in the wheel route not even a chip or dead twig. The stones that once obstructed the way had been carefully placed, not thrown, along the sides of the lane, so as to define its boundaries at bottom, with a kind of half-precise, half-negligent, and wholly picturesque definition. Clumps of wild flowers grew everywhere, luxuriantly, in the interspaces. What to make of all this, of course, I knew not. Here was art, undoubtedly. That did not surprise me. All roads, in the ordinary sense, are works of art. Nor can I say that there was much to wonder at, in the mere excess of art manifested. All that seemed to have been done, might have been done here, with such natural capabilities as they have it in the books on landscape gardening, with very little labour and expense. No, it was not the amount, but the character of the art, which caused me to take a seat on one of the blossomy stones, and gaze up and down this fairy-like avenue for half an hour or more, in bewildered admiration. One thing became more and more evident the longer I gazed, an artist, and one with a most scrupulous eye for form, 
had superintended all these arrangements. The greatest care had been taken to preserve a due medium between the neat and graceful on the one hand, and the pittoresque, in the true sense of the Italian term, on the other. There were few straight and no long uninterrupted lines. The same effect of curvature or of colour appeared twice usually, but not oftener, at any one point of view. Everywhere was variety in uniformity. It was a piece of composition in which the most fastidiously critical taste could scarcely have suggested an emendation. I had turned to the right as I entered this road, and now arising, I continued in the same direction. The path was so serpentine that at no moment could I trace its course for more than two or three paces in advance. Its character did not undergo any material change. Presently, the murmur of water fell gently upon my ear, and in a few moments afterward, as I turned with the road somewhat more abruptly than hitherto, I became aware that a building of some kind lay at the foot of a gentle declivity just before me. I could see nothing distinctly on account of the mist which occupied all the little valley below. A gentle breeze, however, now arose, as the sun was about descending, and while I remained standing on the brow of the slope, the fog gradually became dissipated into wreaths, and so floated over the scene. As it came fully into view, thus gradually, as I describe it, piece by piece, here a tree, there a glimpse of water, and here again the summit of a chimney, I could scarcely help fancying that the whole was one of the ingenious illusions sometimes exhibited under the name of vanishing pictures. By the time, however, that the fog had thoroughly disappeared, the sun had made its way down behind the gentle hills, and thence, as if with a slight chasse to the south, had come again fully into sight glaring with a purplish lustre through a chasm that entered the valley from the west. Suddenly, therefore, and as if by the hand of magic, this whole valley, and everything in it, became brilliantly visible. The first coup d'oeil, as the sun slid into the position described, impressed me very much as I have been impressed when a boy by the concluding scene of some well-arranged theatrical spectacle or melodrama. Not even the monstrosity of colour was wanting, for the sunlight came out through the chasm, tinted all orange and purple, while the vivid green of the grass in the valley was reflected more or less upon all objects from the curtain of vapour that still hung overhead, as if loath to take its total departure from a scene so enchantingly beautiful. The little veil into which I thus peered down from under the fog canopy could not have been more than four hundred yards long, while in breadth it varied from fifty to one hundred and fifty, or perhaps two hundred. It was most narrow at its northern extremity, opening out as it tended southwardly, but with no very precise regularity. The widest portion was within eighty yards of the southern extreme. The slopes which encompassed the vale could not fairly be called hills, unless at their northern face. Here a precipitous ledge of granite arose to a height of some ninety feet, and, as I have mentioned, the valley at this point was not more than fifty feet wide but as the visitor proceeded southwardly from the cliff, he found on his right hand and on his left declivities at once less high, less precipitous, and less rocky, all, in a word, 
sloped and softened to the south, and yet the whole vale was engirdled by eminences, more or less high, except at two points. One of these I have already spoken of. It lay considerably to the north of west, and was where the setting sun made its way, as I have before described, into the amphitheatre through a clearly cut natural cleft in the granite embankment. This fissure might have been ten yards wide at its widest point, so far as the eye could trace it. It seemed to lead up, up, like a natural causeway, into the recesses of unexplored mountains and forests. The other opening was directly at the southern end of the vale. Here, generally, the slopes were nothing more than gentle inclinations, extending from east to west about one hundred and fifty yards. In the middle of this extent was a depression, level with the ordinary floor of the valley. As regards vegetation, as well as in respect to everything else, the scene softened and sloped to the south. To the north, on the craggy precipice, a few paces from the verge, up sprang the magnificent trunks of numerous hickories, black walnuts, and chestnuts, interspersed with occasional oak, and the strong lateral branches thrown out by the walnuts especially, spread far over the edge of the cliff. Proceeding southwardly, the explorer saw at first the same class of trees, but less and less lofty and salvatorish in character. Then he saw the gentler elm, succeeded by the sassafras and locust, these again by the softer linden, redbud, catalpa, and maple, these yet again by still more graceful and more modest varieties. The whole face of the southern declivity was covered with wild shrubbery alone, an occasional silver willow or white poplar excepted. In the bottom of the valley itself, for it must be borne in mind that the vegetation hitherto mentioned grew only on the cliffs or hillsides, were to be seen three insulated trees. One was an elm of fine size and exquisite form. It stood guard over the southern gate of the vale. Another was a hickory, much larger than the elm, and altogether a much finer tree, although both were exceedingly beautiful. It seemed to have taken charge of the northwestern entrance, springing from a group of rocks in the very jaws of the ravine, and throwing its graceful body at an angle of nearly forty-five degrees far out into the sunshine of the amphitheatre. About thirty yards east of this tree stood, however, the pride of the valley, and beyond all question the most magnificent tree I have ever seen, unless, perhaps, among the cypresses of the Ichia Tucani. It was a triple-stemmed tulip-tree, the Liriodendron tulipiferum, one of the natural order of magnolias. Its three trunks, separated from the parent at about three feet from the soil, and diverging very slightly, and gradually, were not more than four feet apart, at the point where the largest stem shot out into foliage. This was at an elevation of about eighty feet. The whole height of the principal division was one hundred and twenty feet. Nothing can surpass in beauty the form or the glossy vivid green of the leaves of the tulip tree. In the present instance they were fully eight inches wide, but their glory was altogether eclipsed 
by the gorgeous splendour of the profuse blossoms conceive closely congregated a million of the largest and most resplendent tulips only thus can the reader get any idea of the picture i would convey and then the stately grace of the clean delicately granulated columnar stems the largest four feet in diameter at twenty from the ground the innumerable blossoms mingling with those of other trees scarcely less beautiful although infinitely less majestic filled the valley with more than arabian perfumes the general floor of the amphitheatre was grass of the same character as that i had found in the road if anything more deliciously soft thick velvety and miraculously green it was hard to conceive how all this beauty had been attained i have spoken of two openings into the vale from the one to the northwest issued a rivulet which came gently murmuring and slightly foaming down the ravine until it dashed against the group of rocks out of which sprang the insulated hickory here after encircling the tree it passed on a little to the north of east leaving the tulip tree some twenty feet to the south and making no decided alteration in its course until it came near the midway between the eastern and western boundaries of the valley at this point after a series of sweeps it turned off at right angles and pursued a generally southern direction meandering as it went until it became lost in a small lake of irregular figure although roughly oval that lay gleaming near the lower extremity of the vale this lakelet was perhaps a hundred yards in diameter at its widest part no crystal could be clearer than its waters its bottom which could be distinctly seen consisted altogether of pebbles brilliantly white its banks of the emerald grass already described rounded rather than sloped off into the clear heaven below and so clear was this heaven so perfectly at times did it reflect all objects above it that where the true bank ended and where the mimic one commenced it was a point of no little difficulty to determine the trout and some other varieties of fish with which this pond seemed to be almost inconveniently crowded had all the appearance of veritable flying fish it was almost impossible to believe that they were not absolutely suspended in the air a light birch canoe that lay placidly on the water was reflected in its minutest fibres with a fidelity unsurpassed by the most exquisitely polished mirror a small island fairly laughing with flowers in full bloom and affording little more space than just enough for a picturesque little building seemingly a fowl house arose from the lake not far from its northern shore to which it was connected by means of an inconceivably light-looking and yet very primitive bridge it was formed of a single broad and thick plank of the tulip wood this was a forty feet long and spanned the interval between shore and shore with a slight but very perceptible arch preventing all oscillation from the southern extreme of the lake issued a continuation of the rivulet which after meandering for perhaps thirty yards finally passed through the depression already described in the middle of the southern declivity and tumbling down a sheer precipice of a hundred feet made its devious and unnoticed way to the hudson 
the lake was deep, at some points thirty feet, but the rivulet seldom exceeded three, while its greatest width was about eight. Its bottom and banks were as those of the pond, if a defect could have been attributed in point of picturesqueness, it was that of excessive neatness. The expanse of the green turf was relieved, here and there, by an occasional showy shrub, such as the hydrangea, or the common snowball, or the aromatic syringa, or, more frequently, by a clump of geraniums, blossoming gorgeously in great varieties. These latter grew in pots, which were carefully buried in the soil, so as to give the plants the appearance of being indigenous. Besides all this, the lawn's velvet was exquisitely spotted with sheep, a considerable flock of which roamed about the vale in company with three tamed deer, and a vast number of brilliantly plumed ducks. A very large mastiff seemed to be in vigilant attendance upon these animals, each and all. Along the eastern and western cliffs, where, toward the upper portion of the amphitheatre, the boundaries were more or less precipitous, grew ivy in great profusion, so that only here and there could even a glimpse of the naked rock be obtained. The northern precipice, in like manner, was almost entirely clothed by grapevines of rare luxuriance, some springing from the soil at the base of the cliff, and others from ledges on its face. The slight elevation which formed the lower boundary of this little domain was crowned by a neat stone wall, of sufficient height to prevent the escape of the deer. Nothing of the fence kind was observable elsewhere, for nowhere else was an artificial enclosure needed. Any stray sheep, for example, which should attempt to make its way out of the vale by means of the ravine, would find its progress arrested, after a few yards' advance, by the precipitous ledge of rock over which tumbled the cascade that had arrested my attention as I first drew near the domain. In short, the only ingress or egress was through a gate, occupying a rocky pass in the road, a few paces below the point at which I stopped to reconnoitre the scene. I have described the brook as meandering very irregularly through the whole of its course. Its two general directions, as I have said, were first from west to east, and then from north to south. At the turn the stream, sweeping backward, made an almost circular loop, so as to form a peninsula which was very nearly an island, and which included about the sixteenth of an acre. On this peninsula stood a dwelling-house, and when I say that this house, like the infernal terrace seen by Vathek, était d'une architecture inconnue dans les annales de la terre. I mean merely that its tout ensemble struck me with the keenest sense of combined novelty and propriety in a word of poetry, for, than in the words just employed, I could scarcely give of poetry in the abstract a more rigorous definition and I do not mean that merely outre was perceptible in any respect. In fact, nothing could well be more simple, more utterly unpretending than this cottage. Its marvellous effect lay altogether in its artistic arrangement as a picture. I could have fancied, while I looked at it, that some eminent landscape painter had built it with his brush. The point of view from which I first saw the valley was not altogether, although it was nearly, the best point from which to survey the house. 
I will therefore describe it as I afterwards saw it, from a position on the stone wall at the southern extreme of the amphitheatre. The main building was about twenty-four feet long and sixteen broad, certainly not more. Its total height from the ground to the apex of the roof could not have exceeded eighteen feet. To the west end of this structure was attached one about a third smaller in all its proportions. The line of its front, standing back about two yards from that of the larger house, and the line of its roof, of course, being considerably depressed below that of the roof adjoining. At right angles to these buildings, and from the rear of the main one, not exactly in the middle, extended a third compartment, very small, being, in general, one-third less than the western wing. The roofs of the two larger were very steep, sweeping down from the ridge-beam with a long concave curve, and extending at least four feet beyond the walls in front, so as to form the roofs of two piazzas. These latter roofs, of course, needed no support, but as they had the air of needing it, slight and perfectly plain pillars were inserted at the corners alone. The roof of the northern wing was merely an extension of a portion of the main roof. Between the chief building and western wing arose a very tall and rather slender square chimney of hard Dutch bricks, alternately black and red, a slight cornice of projecting bricks at the top. Over the gables the roofs also projected very much. In the main building, about four feet to the east and two to the west. The principal door was not exactly in the main division, being a little to the east, while the two windows were to the west. These latter did not extend to the floor, but were much longer and narrower than usual. They had single shutters like doors. The panes were of lozenge form, but quite large. The door itself had its upper half of glass, also in lozenge panes. A movable shutter secured it at night. The door to the west wing was in its gable, and quite simple. A single window looked out to the south. There was no external door to the north wing, and it also had only one window to the east. The blank wall of the eastern gable was relieved by stairs, with a balustrade, running diagonally across it, the ascent being from the south. Under cover of the widely projecting eave, these steps gave access to a door leading to the garret, or rather loft, for it was lighted only by a single window to the north and seemed to have been intended as a storeroom. The piazzas of the main building and western wing had no floors as is usual, but at the doors and at each window large, flat, irregular slabs of granite lay embedded in the delicious turf, affording comfortable footing in all weather. Excellent parts of the same material, not nicely adapted, but with the velvety sod filling frequent intervals between the stones, led hither and thither from the house to a crystal spring about five paces off to the road, or to one or two outhouses that lay to the north beyond the brook, and were thoroughly concealed by a few locusts and catalpas. Not more than six steps from the main door of the cottage, stood the dead trunk of a fantastic pear tree, so clothed from head to foot in the gorgeous bignonia blossoms that one required no little scrutiny to determine what manner of sweet thing it could be. From various arms of this tree hung cages of different kinds. In one, a large wicker cylinder with a ring of top revelled a mockingbird, in another an oriole, in a third the impudent bobolink, 
while three or four more delicate prisons were loudly vocal with canaries. The pillars of the piazza were enwreathed in jasmine and sweet honeysuckle, while from the angle formed by the main structure and its west wing in front sprang a grapevine of unexampled luxuriance. Scorning all restraint, it had clambered first to the lower roof, then to the higher, and along the ridge of this latter it continued to writhe on, throwing out tendrils to the right and left, until at length it fairly attained the east gable, and fell trailing over the stairs. The whole house, with its wings, was constructed of the old-fashioned Dutch shingles, broad, and with unrounded corners. It is a peculiarity of this material to give houses built of it the appearance of being wider at bottom than at top, after the manner of Egyptian architecture, and in the present instance this exceedingly picturesque effect was aided by numerous pots of gorgeous flowers that almost encompassed the base of the buildings. The shingles were painted a dull grey, and the happiness with which this neutral tint melted into the vivid green of the tulip-tree leaves that partially overshadowed the cottage can readily be conceived by an artist. From the position near the stone wall, as described, the buildings were seen at great advantage, for the south-eastern angle was thrown forward, so that the eye took in at once the whole of the two fronts, with the picturesque eastern gable, and at the same time obtained just a sufficient glimpse of the northern wing, with parts of a pretty roof to the spring-house, and nearly half of a light bridge that spanned the brook in the near vicinity of the main buildings. I did not remain very long on the brow of the hill, although long enough to make a thorough survey of the scene at my feet. It was clear that I had wandered from the road to the village, and I had thus good traveller's excuse to open the gate before me and inquire my way at all events. So, without more ado, I proceeded. The road, after passing the gate, seemed to lie upon a natural ledge, sloping gradually down along the face of the north-eastern cliffs. It led me on to the foot of the northern precipice, and thence over the bridge, round by the eastern gable to the front door. In this progress I took notice that no sight of the outhouses could be obtained. As I turned the corner of the gable, the mastiff bounded toward me in stern silence, but with the eye and the whole air of a tiger. I held him out my hand, however, in token of amity, and I never yet knew the dog who was proof against such an appeal to his courtesy. He not only shut his mouth and wagged his tail, but absolutely offered me his paw, afterward extending his civilities to Ponto. As no bell was discernible, I rapped with my stick against the door, which stood half open. Instantly a figure advanced to the threshold, that of a young woman about twenty-eight years of age, slender, or rather slight, and somewhat above the medium height. As she approached, with a certain modest decision of step altogether indescribable, I said to myself, Surely here I have found the perfection of natural, in contradistinction from artificial grace. The second impression which she made on me, but by far the more vivid of the two, was that of enthusiasm. So intense an expression of romance, perhaps I should call it, or of unworldliness, as that which gleamed from her deep-set eyes, had never so sunk into my heart of hearts before. I know not how it is, but this peculiar expression of the eye, wreathing itself occasionally into the lips, is the most powerful, if not absolutely the sole spell, which rivets my interest in woman. 
a romance, provided my readers fully comprehended what I would here imply by the word, romance and womanliness seem to me convertible terms, and after all what man truly loves in woman is simply her womanhood. The eyes of Annie. I heard someone from the interior call her Annie Darling, were spiritual grey, her hair a light chestnut. This is all I had time to observe of her. At her most courteous of invitations I entered, passing first into a tolerably wide vestibule. Having come mainly to observe, I took notice that to my right, as I stepped in, was a window, such as those in front of the house, to the left a door leading into the principal room, while opposite me an open door enabled me to see a small apartment, just the size of the vestibule, arranged as a study, and having a large bow window looking out to the north. Passing into the parlour, I found myself with Mr. Landor, for this I afterwards found was his name. He was civil, even cordial in his manner, but just then I was more intent on observing the arrangements of the dwelling which had so much interested me than the personal appearance of the tenant. The north wing, I now saw, was a bedchamber. Its door opened into the parlour. West of this door was a single window, looking toward the brook. At the west end of the parlour were a fireplace, and a door leading into the west wing, probably a kitchen. Nothing could be more rigorously simple than the furniture of the parlour. On the floor was an ingrain carpet of excellent texture, a white ground spotted with small circular green figures. At the windows were curtains of snowy white jaconet muslin. They were tolerably full, and hung decisively, perhaps rather formally, in sharp parallel plats to the floor, just to the floor. The walls were prepared with a French paper of great delicacy, a silver ground, with a faint green cord running zigzag throughout. Its expanse was relieved merely by three of Julien's exquisite lithographs at Trois Crayons, fastened to the wall without frames. One of these drawings was a scene of oriental luxury, or rather voluptuousness. Another was a carnival piece, spirited beyond compare. The third was a Greek female head, a face so divinely beautiful, and yet of an expression so provokingly indeterminate, never before arrested my attention. The more substantial furniture consisted of a round table, a few chairs, including a large rocking chair, and a sofa, or rather settee. Its material was plain maple, painted a creamy white, slightly interstriped with green, the seat of cane. The chairs and table were to match, but the forms of all had evidently been designed by the same brain which planned the grounds. It is impossible to conceive anything more graceful. On the table were a few books, a large square crystal bottle of some novel perfume, a plain ground glass astral not solar lamp with an Italian shade, and a large vase of resplendently blooming flowers, flowers indeed of gorgeous colours and delicate odour form the sole mere decoration of the apartment. The fireplace was nearly filled with a vase of brilliant geranium. On a triangular shelf in each angle of the room stood also a similar vase, varied only as to its lovely contents. One or two smaller bouquets adorned the mantel, 
and late violets clustered about the open windows it is not the purpose of this work to do more than give in detail a picture of mr landor's residence as i found it how he made it what it was and why with some particulars of mr landor himself may possibly form the subject of another article End of chapter 18